Good morning and welcome. I'm Annie Madonia, Chief Advancement Officer of the LenFest Institute, and welcome back for day three of the LenFest News Philanthropy Summit. We're looking forward to another great day. Uh, this inaugural summit is dedicated exclusively to fundraising professionals, all of you and us who are so critical to a thriving local news ecosystem. Our goal with the summit and with the LenFest News Philanthropy Network is to build and support a network of development professionals now a growing and vibrant community of practice as we engage our communities and build this vital resource, philanthropy, for local news. The News Philanthropy Network, if you haven't attended any of our other programming, provides year-round webinars, deep dive training, and sharing of best practices for more than a thousand members from nonprofit, for-profit, digital, print, legacy, and startup news organizations across the country and around the world, and it's all free. Our next program, if you can believe it, is on Monday at one o'clock Eastern time when the News Revenue Hub and Newsmatch at INN will host a workshop with last minute tips and tricks for writing year end fundraising solicitation emails. As with all of our programs, the workshop is free and open to all. So we hope you'll join us on Monday afternoon. This morning, we'll kick off with a conversation with Jim Brady, the newly appointed VP of journalism at the Knight Foundation. It was a real pleasure to sit down and chat with Jim last week, and we hope you enjoy the discussion. It was pre-recorded, so when it's finished, we'll go live to the conversation and take your questions and have a nice discussion. But in the meantime, please feel free to put your questions in the chat as we go, if you'd like. So Will, why don't we start the video? the newly appointed Vice President of Journalism at the Knight Foundation. We are really thrilled to have you here. Thank you for joining us. No, thanks, for, thanks for the invite. Oh, we're delighted. Um, and this is a convening of development professionals. So there are a lot of people here who are really interested in hearing from you and getting to know you. So I thought we could spend a little bit of time getting to know you personally and then hear about your career and lessons learned and then talk about your views on journalism and philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And then sure. we'll open it up to questions. Sound good? Sounds great. Great. Well, folks, because this has been pre-recorded, please feel free to put your questions in the chat as we go, if you'd like, and we'll circle back to them in a broader discussion when we go live. So, Jim, let's get to know you the person a little bit with a lightning round. You are from? Long Island, Huntington, Long Island. Ah, fellow native New Yorker, hello. What was your first newspaper job? I uh, was a intern, sports writing intern for Newsday in 1989. Wow, and your favorite assignment? Um, if there's one, maybe you can't, can, you know, it's hard to Well, say. yeah, my favorite favorite <laughs> event I ever attended was the 92 Olympics. So going to Barcelona, the first international trip for, I worked as a researcher for NBC. Um, that was the funnest, I was there for six weeks and learned a lot about a lot of things in those six weeks, but it was for a 25 year old kid, that was a lot of fun. That must have been amazing. Yeah. One of the joys of the industry, get to see and do a lot of really interesting things. Okay, uh, who's your favorite musician or genre, if you can pick just one? Classic rock. I am a, I am a, a suburban, a suburban kid from the '80s, so I'm a huge Rush fan. So not not, ah, the, not the not the political commentator, the Canadian power trio. <laughs> Rush, I always think of Rush as a New Yorker. I think of Rush as a strong Long Island. Uh, people in Long Island love Rush. Um, they did. So bucket list. I understand that you have done something a couple of times that is high on my bucket list to do with my husband, which is road tripping across the country in an RV with, with your wife, Joan. Is that is that true? That is correct. We've done How three cross... Did you... Three. We did the first two in a car. 2003, we were on the road for about three and a half months. 2009 for three and then 2019 for about three. Um, wow. The last one was in an RV. First two were just in a, a regular old car, but uh, two dogs on the second trip, one dog each on the first and third. So we even traveled with uh, canines. Did they love the trip too? Oh yeah, they loved it. They got to run on every beach. We have one, one of our beagles has since passed, but he got to say he was in, we didn't get to say anything because he's a beagle, but he was in 48 <laughs> states. Um, and Hank is a, Little pal here is still with us as a has seen 48 as well. We were trying to get Hank to Alaska last year so we could break Fred's record, but uh, COVID kind of sapped that. Well, that's too bad. I suddenly got this picture of you and Joan with your dogs in front of the welcome to XYZ state sign. 
oh, know, yeah. all across all across the country. What did you love about the trip? Why did you decide to do those? You know, I just I, like a lot of people who'd worked in media, I spent a lot of time in planes going from East Coast to West Coast and kind of always wistfully was looking down, wondering, wishing I'd been down there, just kind of driving between. I just, I love just popping into small towns, finding a great place to eat, reading up on history, meeting some people. And so I think it's a good way to see the country as a journalist. I'm always curious about lots of things, but one is, you know, the country writ large outside of, I've lived my entire life in Washington and in New York. So it's easy to look at somebody with my background and say, well, it's just like East Coast. This guy doesn't know anything about, about the East Coast, but I just, I wanted to get out so I could understand, I don't even understand, but just get to see the rest of the country and get to meet people and see all these beautiful places, national parks. So it just was something I always wanted to do since I was a kid. And when, uh, when I left uh, AOL in uh, 2003, uh, that was the moment where my wife and I were like, let's do it. And uh, she wasn't sure she wanted to do it, uh, but about a week into the trip, she was like, you know what, this is, this is awesome. Let's keep going. And then ended up being out for, I said, three, three and a half months. Oh, sounds wonderful. I'm so, I'm so jealous. I looked through one of your blogs and I think I'm going to copy it and <laughs> keep it in my future travel folder <laughs> and, and just, just follow watch, your road watch, trip. Watch what you eat. They're not good for your, uh, <laughs> cross country trips are not great for your weight. There's always a good burger joint somewhere. And, um, oh, I'm you, sure. gotta, you, got, you gotta be uh, disciplined, which I have never been on any of those trips. I'm sure I have a friend who's driven across the country taking black and white photos of diners. Yeah. And I think he would, he would probably say the same thing. It's, it's anyway. better for you to take pictures of them than eat in them. Uh, yeah, this is true. This is true. So let's talk about your career for a minute. You've been a reporter. You served as executive editor of WashingtonPost.com, I believe, during the Graham era. And you've been edit, you were editor in chief of Digital First Media and Alden Company, who's been in the news a lot recently. And mm -hmm. then on the other side of the ledger, you've been an entrepreneur. You launched and ran Spirited Media, and you've done consulting. I mean, you've really worked across the field in lots of different types of roles. Can you share one or two lessons from each place, sort of the big takeaways that helped you on your journey to where you are now? Yeah, I mean, I think every, I think every job provides you with takeaways. Um, that you apply kind of to the next job and every job subsequently. But I think um, certainly for some of them, the one that you didn't mention in there was working at AOL in uh, yeah. late 90s, early um, 2000s. And I think that was a really key one for me because prior to that, I had been in, I had been on the launch team of WashingtonPost.com in 1996, had been in newsrooms my whole life and really did accept the idea that the newsrooms did this thing that was separate from everything else. Like, yes, there were people out there who made money for the company and there were people out there who did all these other things, but we were the heart and soul of the company and as such could not be touched and could not be bothered by all these other things. And I will say going to AOL and sitting, you know, being told on my first day, like you should have lunch with the guy who sells your channels. It was like lunch with the guy who sells my channels. That's appalling. But in four years I was there, I just learned that, my God, there's this entire system around the newsroom, technology, back office, uh, product. And, and it's insane for me not to understand how all of these things fit to the big picture. Uh, how do I, how can I possibly know how this company's doing if I work in this one part and plug my ears around everything else? So I think AOL, the big lesson was just understand that the newsroom is obviously crucially important, but it cannot live on its own. It, it cannot survive in the wild without revenue teams trying to figure out how to support it and technology teams trying to figure out how to keep it up and running. And so I got a much broader view of what the digital uh, whole digital ecosystem was and I've been very engaged in it ever since and have never looked back and said, newsrooms need to be disengaged from uh, how they make money because I think that's delusional. Um, it was a delusion we could afford to have when newspapers had 25% margins, but it was still a delusion then. It was just one that, as I said, was convenient, but um, so I learned a lot of, and about that. Really at AOL, which in a lot of ways was, you know, there were a lot of things I didn't like about that job, but that was the takeaway. Really was um, the broad ecosystem. I think, I think at the Post, um, I mean, uh, that was you just learned how important it was to to just try things and how how freeing it was to try things because you know Don Graham is you know one of my favorite people on earth, and Don, you know, when I got that job, said experiment every day, all day try things you'll never get you'll never get you'll never get any backlash from me for trying things and he was good for that never gave me any, any backlash for trying things and they didn't all work but he encouraged innovation and he encouraged it because he knew that you had to innovate to eventually get where you wanted to go even if you had to stub your toe every once in a while and so that was really 
you know, all about like, let's be first at something. And I didn't want to play that game that you always hear, which is let's, let's let somebody else innovate and we'll be a fast follower. I'm like, I, that's, that's not interesting to me. I want to be the one in front. And uh -huh. that means sometimes you're going to, you know, with the, you know, sometimes you're going to, you're going to pay a price for that. But so that was certainly what I learned there. I think at digital first, it was going into jobs with, op with an open and open eyes. Um, was just knowing what you're getting yourself into. And in that particular case, I got hired. I mean, Alden, Alden owned digital first at that point, but it was in that era where Alden was really experimenting with digital and created this team Thunderdome, a digital um, team I built in New York. And the project was called Thunderdome. Um, and they let me, you know, hire 50 people up there and 50 people have gone on to great things in this industry. Um, but I also knew that we were owned by a hedge fund and at some point, they were going to potentially do what head funds often do. But so when it happened, it was unfortunate. And it was unfortunate that the whole team that you had hired um, eventually was let go. And I decided to go with them. But the idea, the lesson learned there was just, you know, um, be careful what you, you know, you, you kind of knew it might end that way. And so I was prepared for that. But it was, it was not a lot of fun. Um, but it was, I went into it eyes wide open. And as such, I think at the end, the disappointment wasn't as much as it might have been if I went into it bright eyed, bushy tailed and assuming that everything was going to end well. So that I'd brought a little bit of experience and gray beard to that so that the ending was not as painful as it might have been otherwise. Yeah, well, it's sort of after your long history of experimenting and innovation, you could look at that as maybe one more experimental role. <laughs> yeah, it might work, yeah, might I, not work. And that's just right. what happens. Yeah, and then the entrepreneurial side of things, I mean, I think the lesson you learn pretty quickly in that is that you dream about the site that you want to launch that you know is going to resonate with an audience and you kind of forget that there are a hundred other steps along the way that you have to do to get that site live. It's like, you know, you've got to have a CMS, you've got to have, you got to register trademarks, you got to file for taxes, you know, got to pay taxes and, you know, you've got to do all incorporation papers. And I think one of the things I really took away from that was we, we probably don't really have a shortage of ideas in this industry, but we do have a shortage of people who have either the financial wherewithal or just the mm -hmm. patience to go through all of the steps required to launch something brand new. And certainly in this, in this job, it's something I'm looking at pretty closely because I feel like if we could figure out a way to um, significantly increase the number of, I'm talking strictly entrepreneurial here, but if you could figure out a way to double the number of sites that can launch in a given year because you've made the tools easier and you've made the, uh, the build up cheaper, um, that would be a good thing because even if a lot of them still fail, which they will, it's entrepreneurship, you know, and, and the, at the end of the day, but if you're able to put a lot more experiments out there um, and you have the same failure rate, you still have a lot more sites, new sites out there covering communities, whether geographical or ethnic than you do now. So part of what I certainly learned in that was it shouldn't be this hard for every single entrepreneur trying to launch to have to cross all of these bridges. And we were more uh, well um, equipped to do that than most. And it was still hard. It's interesting because what you're saying is resonating with me completely. And I'm thinking about it as a development professional with my fundraising hat on when we got into this business of fundraising for local news, you know, it was hard for all of us to get started. And then all of a sudden you start to see there's a whole cohort of people trying to do the same thing. And then how do we share best practices and how do we learn from each other so that we're not all reinventing the wheel, you know, all the time. And how do we give our organizations enough runway to do what needs to be done in order to know whether or not it's sustainable and certainly right. funding is part of that. But, you know, the, the, the planning and the work that it takes, it's it's not for the faint of heart and it's not short term either, right. hopefully. Yeah, and, and it will never be short term, but there probably could be ways to make it a little bit easier than it is now. I mean, to, to yeah. echo what you're saying, I mean, you know, I've had this I've used this line for many, many years, probably the point of exhaustion for some people, but um, but journalism is is definitely in the huddling forum phase right now, which is we're either going to share, we're either going to share what we know, we, we're either going to share what it is we've learned, share what it is we can with others, or else, you know, we're, we're all pretty much at peril. This is not a time to, you know, wander off into the blizzard and think I I, I, I alone know the way out of this. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can give that a shot if you want. I think I know where we'll find you and you know, a hundred years, but, um, but maybe you will be the one who finds a way out, but that's not really what I'm, I'm not interested in. in uh, what I'm interested in is figuring out how we learn, take knowledge that we have gathered, tools that we have built, technology we have created, and figure out a way to, to have people share those things so that the path to launching or the path to monetization is easier than it is right now. And 
you know, the, look, the good news is there's no shortage of people in digital who want to share. I, I, I tell people this all the time. Digital has always been willing to share. Digital people have always been willing to share with other digital people. Why? Because in 1996 and 1997, when we all started doing this, we all had more in common with the digital people at other newspaper sites than we had with the print newsroom, which didn't care what we were doing. So like nobody at the Washington Post print side in 1996 cared much about WashingtonPost.com, but the people who worked at USAToday.com and NYTimes.com and at WSJ.com, they really cared about what we were doing at WashingtonPost.com and vice versa. So we, we shared information back then. And I think that's just carried through in the industry so that digital folks are not like withholding of information. The key is we just have to make sure that how do we take all of those conversations just right now how happen over a beer or a coffee or at a conference, how do we make sure as much of that stuff is getting out there in the broader uh, kind of ecosystem as it can? There's a lot of that's already happening. I'm not suggesting none of that is happening right now, but I feel like it can be even more efficient so that someone who wants to start something new or an existing site that wants to figure out how to better take advantage of you know, uh, native advertising or AI has ways they can dig into that topic and be able to try things without feeling like they have to start from scratch. I think that we, I don't know that we have the uh, time or, or the or the wherewithal to really start from scratch on everything. I think there has to be, you know, there's always going to be variations in how sites turn out or how companies turn out based on who the founder is, the operational, uh, operational competency of the leadership team, timing, economy. But the key is let's try to create conditions so that more of those things can get started. And I think that's certainly a, will be a focus. How do you feel about the pace of change and what you've seen sort of over the arc of your career? I mean, organizations, I think, were slow to change for a period of time. Do you feel like that's accelerating, that everybody gets it now, that it's just a matter of time before digital is leading absolutely everything? Or do you think it's still a long slog to get us where we need to be? No, I think it, I don't think the time is that, I don't think the time is that far off. I mean, I think it's clear digital and digital even in, even that phrase can be split into lots of different things whether it's yeah. you know mobile and desktop and you know and other things that will be coming um, and there's lots of different variations inside that what type of media but it's clear that things are headed toward a, a digital era i think um i i think if you haven't started to make the shift by now it's probably too late um yeah. in terms of if you're if you really haven't focused on transformation Probably 15 years behind on that and probably too far behind. But yeah, I think that's clear. It's going to continue to accelerate toward digital. I think yeah. there'll be print publications. I don't doubt that, that they will exist. Do I think that I would be putting a lot of resources into figuring out how to optimize print publication at this point? Probably not, but easy for me to say, I don't have to look at those P and L's, but I think that's been the problem, right? I think it's the classic innovators dilemma, which is you're making lots of money uh, or at least were making lots of money on a print publication and you know, there's a, a executive at the Washington Post who um, metaphorically described it to me once. And he said, the, he said, you're asking me to look at this little garden on this digital garden on the side of the road. And you keep telling me how pretty these flowers are going to be when they grow. But I'm over here on the print highway where I have a tractor trailer jackknifing in front of me right now. And I really can't focus on your garden while I'm trying to figure out how to deal with this problem in front of me. And I think that I think accurately described how a lot of people looked at it, which is, I get it, this thing is the future, but I got this huge business in front of me that is cratering or is in great peril right now. And even if I know that that's the future, I can't really focus on it as much as I have to focus on this. And I do think that was a real problem for a while. I think it's why WashingtonPost.com's model of being very separate from the newspaper and business side and newsroom side were totally separate organizations who reported into different parts of the company than the newspaper did. I would say was the right strategy because it allowed us to not worry about the tractor trailer jackknifing. It allowed us to look mm -hmm. at focus on the garden on the side of the road and grow it without having to worry about that problem. Um, and and similarly to grow digital audience without having to worry about, you know, whether we, you know, were we putting the right stories on the front page? We were doing what we thought was right based on what we knew about the medium. So I do think the future is obviously obviously going to be digital. Um, that doesn't yeah. mean there's not going to be, and I and I say that, you know not knowing that there's still gonna be, you know, we're not even talking about and should be talking about the local broadcast, which is still doing pretty well. And based on my watching uh, DC uh, local television this morning and seeing 72 straight political ads on the gubernatorial election, clearly there's still money there. And, and, and so there, I think those, that platform is still gonna be relevant for a while, but from a print perspective, I think it's clearly gonna be digital over print. 
So you've seen a tremendous arc during your career that's probably informed so much of how you're thinking about your work now, but why did you make the jump into philanthropy? What about it appealed to you? Why did you want to do this? I think just opportunity to have a, an impact on the broader, uh, this broader industry that I've been in my whole career and love and, and believe is crucially important to the future of democracy to be healthier than it is today. Um, yeah. And so I was happy consulting. I had lots of clients and I was, you know, a keeper of my own schedule. There was a lot to like about that. But when night called, it was like, boy, this has always been a job that has fascinated me. Um, and, uh, and, you know, like any subject, I have many thoughts had many thoughts and, and decided, why not? This would be a lot of fun to do if uh, if I make it through the process. And so I got in the process and and, and got through it. And, but I think it's a, it's a fascinating place. And you just even in the two months I've been here, you just on three or four calls a day where someone has a great idea or is doing already doing something great and are looking for support to help con to continue doing it. And so you get inspired by all the good things you hear. And uh, and it's, it's, it's a great catbird seat to sit in just to hear all these ideas that are flying all over the industry. And, but it's even better because in many of those cases, you can help, you can actually do something. It's one thing to hear great ideas and go, man, I wish I could do something. In this job you get, you can do something. And, uh, and so you get the benefit of learning all this fascinating stuff and being able to provide support uh, when you can. And so that was just too good a, too good a gig to turn down. And I'd, I'd been managing newsrooms most of my 25, uh, or I got it's more than that now, 27 years, I guess, in digital. And uh, I just was, I wasn't really in a mood to, to I wasn't really in the newsroom management mood at this point. I really wanted to do something that was like this, which was a, a major, major uh, um, opportunity to help journalism at large. Well, it's an, it's an incredible role and there's so much wonderful work, you know, to be done. Uh, and it must be very exciting to be able to, as you say, now feel like you, you can do something about it. Yeah. So now, as you're on the other side of the table as a funder, how do you how are you thinking about the field of journalism and how you're gonna and and, and how it's set up? I mean, we have a for-profit sector and a growing mm -hmm. nonprofit sector. How do you think about the two of them and the role of philanthropy for for each? Well, I think they both have to exist. I'm not a I, you know, I'm not a believer that the future is all nonprofit. I'm not a believer that it's all for profit. I think there's always going to be both models and there should be both models. I think they come with different advantages and disadvantages, but the for-profit model obviously comes with an advantage that if you can find a model or a couple of models that seem promising, that opens the door for countless people to try that model. Whereas you know, even a nonprofit model, it's, it's not necessarily scalable where, you know, you have, every time you wanna start a nonprofit, you know, investigative nonprofit, for example, you've gotta raise the funds for that. You've gotta, you know, every one of those is an individual effort where if you provide a for-profit path that people could follow, you could bloom lots of flowers, thousands of flowers. So I like the fact that they'll both will exist. Um, I think, you know, how you support for profits, I think it's part of the way we've done it, um, you know, is by funding things like Lion, uh, News Revenue Hub, um, News Pack. Uh, those things are all tools that can be used by countless numbers of sites. Some of them will be for nonprofits, some of them are for-profits. So, so some of that money, you know, some of those savings eventually accrue to for-profits, even though we don't fund them directly. So I think, I think we're continuing to look for opportunities like that, getting back to what I was saying before, to be able to knock parts of this, make parts of this easier. So if you decide you want to use, you know, Tiny News or Newspack as a CMS, that's great. If you want to use News Revenue Hub to launch membership models, that's great. If you want to use Blue Lena uh, for its services, you can do that. So the key is how many of these other pieces can you knock out of the um, sort of the uh, chain to allow for sites to make it launch more quickly or just get more efficient in their uh, expense base. So I think we spend a lot of time, rightfully so, of course, and by the way, I don't mean this to say, a lot of time focused on the revenue side and, and we should, but I think there's also the other side of the ledger, which is how do we make sites cheaper to launch and how do we uh, reduce the overhead cost of getting sites launched? Because that's a big barrier for people getting started is how much it costs to get started. So, um, so I think yeah. continuing to look at areas like that will be something we'll do. Yeah, not not many places have Jerry Lundquist and Stuart Bainham's, right. uh, who, yes. who we all heard from earlier in the summit, um, and those cities are blessed. But being able to have that kind of sort of back of house infrastructure that is so important to success and have everybody be able to access it as as needed and wanted is really critical. And that speaks to your earlier points about 
you know, not reinventing yeah. the wheel or climbing up Mount Everest on your own. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, the truth is, this maybe maybe there's a site somewhere that falls into this category, but I don't think as, if you asked a thousand sites that have launched and gone out of business so why it didn't work, I don't think any of them would say my CMS. Like, right? I mean, <laughs> that's probably not the reason you succeed. And then the ones who succeeded probably wouldn't say that either. I think the end of the day is you need to have a good CMS, but it's not the deal breaker for your site most of the time. I don't think, some may argue with me, but I think the key is like, what are you covering? Are you covering it well? Uh, are you serving the community you, you aimed to, to serve? Um, and then are you focusing enough on building a business? Uh, and if it's for-profit, well, actually it doesn't matter if it's for-profit or not-profit, but figuring out how to grow revenue. Um, those are the things that matter. I don't think a lot of people live or die on their content management system or whether they had you know, uh, the right CRM. Those things all help. Right but they can't right. get you over the hump if you don't get the other stuff right. How does the issue of scalability factor into this? You know, uh, sort of for-profit news sites tend to have, you know, much larger scale, much broader scale than many nonprofits. Do you think that'll mm -hmm. change over time or do you think that also adds to the balance in any given community? No, I think that, I think um, that'll probably change over time to some extent. I think there'll still be uh, for-profit sites that cover entire metropolitan areas, for example. But I also think though, even those sites that cover the whole areas are gonna to have to choose what parts of that area, they, what parts of that journalism they wanna bite off. Like it wouldn't surprise me in a lot of cities around the country if 10 years from now, the Metro dailies are really down to doing enterprise investigative, um, like the core things that only they can really do because yeah. they have the staff to do it. But by then, maybe they're partnering with somebody. Maybe they're partnering with the Athletic on Sports. Maybe they're partnering with Chalkbeat on Education Coverage. Um, maybe there's a local site that really covers entertainment well that they're partnering for that. I do think you're going to need to see more of that partnership model because I, I don't. I think the era of the 300-person newsroom in in a, in a market is over. I mean, I, you know, I just don't think that's going to exist outside of places where somebody can fund that. But I do think you're going to start to see these collaborations where maybe the big player in town sort of partners with eight or nine local players in town. And you put all that together, maybe you have, you know, something that covers a significant chunk of what the paper used to cover in the glory days, but it's like eight or nine different organizations biting off pieces of that, which on the other end, if you're very niche, you still have some opportunities to create revenue that are in some ways easier than if you're too broad. So if you just cover entertainment, you just cover education, you just cover business, you might have a better opportunity to build a revenue base if you're that niche. And then, then all of those sites can get together at some point and you know, maybe, you know, whether it's formally or informally, sort of stitch together a pretty good coverage of that city. But I don't think it's gonna be one dominant player that, that yeah. has 200 journalists. I just think the economics won't support it. So let's talk about funding just for a second. I mean, I know it's early, but what priorities are starting to emerge for you and for the foundation you know, under your under your leadership on the journalism side? I mean, it sounds like collaboration might be one of them or? Yeah, that's a, it's an important one. And I think, you know, in addition to that, I mean, it's collaboration between, you know, philanthropy, phil you know, philanthropic organizations as well. Um, and not that that doesn't happen already because a lot of it does, but I think even more intentional of, you know, what there's, there's things at night uh, will fund, but we should, you know, I'd like to be in a position where we're activating, you know, capital elsewhere too, like getting ahead of the curve and calling people to say like, hey, we're interested in this thing in your backyard is this something you might go in with us on like trying to be more organized uh, than um, not more organized I, I said some of this already happens but try to be organized in a way that allows more of that so i don't want the collaboration just to be at the at the, at the publisher level but really at top to bottom um i mean i'd like to focus a little bit more on broadcast uh, i do think like it's a it's a and that means both uh, public media and also uh commercial um again the for-profit, you know, we've already done some work with like Arizona State on, uh, you know, on table stakes, um, and we'll continue to do those kind of things. But, um, but I want to do even more than that because I think that's a it's a sector that's really an important part of the, the media um, ecosystem. I'm tired of using the word ecosystem, but I couldn't come up with. Yeah, we have to find a better word. Kind of word. We really do have to <laughs> so find told. a better word. That one has been that word is that word has been beaten to death. Um, but so I do want to you know see what we can do uh, in that area because it's you know it's still a very vibrant it is still the medium which informs an awful lot of people and I think you know we spend a lot of time focused on on the future of print and, and we should it's an important piece of it but I don't want to have that happen at the expense of thinking about 
the role that public media and uh, commercial broadcast uh, plays in a lot of markets. And I do want to focus on figuring out ways to help for profits. I mean, not that we haven't already, but I want to maintain that because I do think it's healthy to have for profit and not profit models. They're both, like I said, some commonalities, but a lot of differences. And I think the world is that the media world is better when we have both of those active. So you'll sort of be doubling down on the, the business of news in some ways, as opposed yes. to funding newsroom initiatives. Correct. I should have yeah. said that at the top. Yes, business sustainability is crucial. I mean, it's it's what this is all about. I mean, you know, there's no shortage of people with there's no shortage of great journalists with great ideas who could hire great staffs to cover fascinating communities. I don't think our problem is not a supply of ideas or a supply. Of, of, of models that would work. It's that we don't have a way to pay for most of them yet. And so mm -hmm. to me, and that's why I, that, but this, that's why I've spent so much time talking about collaboration, because I don't really mean collaboration like a kumbaya, let's all hug and work together thing. I mean, that's great if that's what happens. I mean, collaboration to save, um, to either generate revenue or, or save money on expenses, like if things that are focused on the bottom line. It's collaboration that, that, helps business sustainability not collaboration for collaboration's sake because i think mm -hmm. that's that's just that's just cotton candy in the sense of it just it doesn't there's really not much there if you just say that but that's why i'm focusing collaboration specifically on sharing of things that will uh you know if you share knowledge and someone's able to apply knowledge to you know something that, you know, a blind of business they're trying to develop that can help their revenue side. If they are able to use a CMS that cost half as much as the one they're using before, but still has full functionality because they're using tiny news or news pack, then that's, you know, $12,000 a year, you know, saved if they were saving, I'm sorry, if they saved a thousand a month. So like, I want, I want the collaboration ideas to lead to something positive on the PL front. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, that's why sustainability has to be what, what, what do we have? Can't pay for what we do, then all the rest of it is doesn't matter. Doesn't really matter. And yeah. that's been, and that's been a frustration, you know, that's certainly been a frustration for the many years. I mean, my father, when I was, my father was a, a journalist in college, but didn't get into it in his career, but knew enough about kind of how the journalism and business sides work together that he told me when I got my job, first job at the Post when I was in college, a part time job, he said, don't ever let anybody tell you it does not matter how you make money. And so, and I took that, I used to read the post annual reports because I was a shareholder and I used to focus a lot on the revenue side, but was not surrounded by many people who did. I cared, like going back to my AOL story, I cared how AOL made money, but I learned at AOL was all the other parts, the technology and, the, but like, but before that I cared about how um, the Washington Post made money and I knew how it made money. And I do think we have to be laser focused on that. If you just think you have an idea, but no business plan, don't waste your time. Right. It won't last long. Uh, right. business if you build it, they will come evolve. doesn't hold true. <laughs> yeah, and business models just don't evolve. You don't launch something and all of a sudden the business model comes out of nowhere. The only time you could really do that was if you're able to generate ridiculous traffic out of the gate and you could build some ad revenue, but that's not going to be the future revenue model. You're going to have to have a plan for how to grow membership or how to build a subscription-based business or, you know, and that just doesn't just happen. You have to be intentional about that. So given your history, you know, and long career in experimentation and people like Don Graham saying to you, you will never get in trouble for innovating, try it, try, you know, see what works, fail or succeed quickly. Do you see investing in a lot of experimentation or do you hope to help guide organizations to resources that are already there and sort of consolidate all of the, you know, focusing on a few key experiments out there that, that seem to be working so far? Well, I think both, because I think there are some that are out there that are working. There's also other parts of that sort of chain of things uh, that's not, nobody has built a, a common solution for. So it'll be both. I know that's a lazy answer, but it is true. No, it's not lazy, um, it's true. Yeah, we'll definitely fund some, but I don't think we'll fund experiments that if they work would help the organization um, we funded and nobody else. I mean, literally one of the questions I think we've talked about applying to every grant was to say, how will this grant help news organizations that don't see a dime of this money? Like literally, like not involved in this grant at all. But if, how is somebody going to learn from this? Are we going to provide something out of this that they can take and learn from? And if the answer is no, that's going to be a pretty big ding because funding individual projects, unless there's really some fascinating new wrinkle in this one thing, but even in that case, like the learning we would derive from that would have to be applicable to the whole, or to the whole media world. We still wouldn't do it if it was just going to help this one site. So we'll fund things if we think there's opportunity to, to help um, 
you know, a lot of other sites, I don't, or I keep saying sites, this guy's been on the web too long, a lot of other news organizations. Yeah. But, um, but I think, but it would be through that prism to some extent. I think we want to experiment, but experiment in ways that lead to broader adoption of something. Yeah. Well, before we move into the Q&A, any advice for, advice for development professionals? You've got a room full of your new best friends. <laughs> well, I'm the new guy. I'm the new guy in the room. So, <laughs> um, but what, what advice would you give us about the do's and, and don'ts? I mean, you've, you've had to make pitches in the past and yeah. you've, you've had to go out and raise money. So coach us a little bit about what you think works, what you don't want to see, what you like to see. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, as someone who went out and pitched a lot and raised some money, I mean, I think the, you know, the thing I, the thing I always felt was important was you, in, in the end, regardless of what you're going to have, you know, people will come pitch you and they'll have a revenue sheet in there. If they haven't launched yet, they have no idea if those revenue numbers are going to play out in any way, shape or form. That's a total fantasy slide. We, and anybody who's giving money pretty much knows it's a fantasy slide. So you're sort of back to the quality of the person in front of you and <clears throat> the team that they've put in front of you and the quality of the idea. Um, and I think, you know, what I'm always looking for is, is, uh, depth of thinking and like how this fits strategically what gap is this filling that that exists out there right now is this somebody i feel like i i can trust you know because at some point like you know you're putting your hand money in the hands of somebody and your reputation is on the line for it certainly having some feeling that this is somebody um you know who's got a good record of of being a straight shooter and and, and will tell you the good and the bad i think certainly uh is important i also think the other piece of advice that I mean, I'm sure this is advice everybody already knows, but uh, but I learned when I was on the other side of the table that in the end, the best answer I could get from anybody I pitched to was a quick yes. And the second best answer I could get was a quick no. And the yeah. worst answer I could get is no answer. And I think that's something I, I know we want to apply. I want to apply to this too, which is if we're not interested in something, the sooner we can tell somebody that, the better, because it's one less place they have to follow up with. It's one less deck they have to put together to keep us updated. I think keep us updated anyway, because maybe we'll fund down the road. But I really think it's important to get back to people quickly with an answer either way, because nothing drove me crazier than sending five follow-up emails to somebody only to have them say, we're going to pass. It's like, you know, you probably knew you were going to pass four months ago. And that was four follow-up emails ago. Um, and that get, makes you crazier than all. I said, we got for spirited. I got turned down by somebody like the morning after I pitched. And I was like, you know, we just don't do local stuff. It's really interesting what you're doing, but we just don't do local. And I was like, all right, well, thank you for letting me know so quickly. And it's like, we usually, we usually don't get thank yous like this. It's like, well, I'm dealing with a whole lot of people who haven't given me an answer in six months. So believe me, I appreciate, I appreciate your answer. Even if I don't, I wish it was a different one. I'm just glad I got one. And I think that's something I know I want to uh, put into play here. But that was one of the most frustrating things being on the other side of the table was the incessant waiting and getting no answers on things. And I yeah, got, that's... you know, I got a long way to go on that still in this job because I'm still dealing with the fire hose uh, syndrome of being just new to the organization, new to philanthropy, new to the person that's first nonprofit. But, but I'm not too far from being in a position where I feel like I'll be uh, on top of all that and I'll uh, be able to actually practice what I just said. Not that um, I haven't, I don't think, I'm not sure that I haven't done it yet, but I'm still dealing yeah, with the, uh, the busy phase, but I do yeah, think no, that's I, important too. Yeah, have, but there was I a, there was a study, I think TechCrunch did this like four or five years ago. I thought it was a really interesting uh, piece, which talked about what slides in a pitch deck people tend to look at. And it was like the one that they looked at the least was the revenue slide. And it was, it was, I think people found that kind of shocking because at the end of the day, this is about business and how can the revenue slide get less viewed than most? It's because everybody knows what's on a brand new pitch is somewhat valueless because you don't have any market data yet. You don't have any actual historicals to put against that. And you don't really know. Um, but what they looked at the most was team. And I think there's something to be said for that, which is you're investing in people uh, as much as you're investing in the idea. I mean, they have to both be there, but, um, but yeah, I think that's uh, certainly what I, is important to me too. That's all great advice. Great advice. At one point you said to me once, um, you know, don't tell me what you did. Tell me why you did it. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that speaks to the impact of our work, um, of our news organizations, why we're putting things into place. It's, it's yeah. not good enough to just say you're doing it. There has to be a reason why and an outcome you're trying to achieve. Yeah, exactly. And the outputs and outcomes really matter. And, um, and I think it's, and that's a thing too, I realized this today too, I think one of the, and this may be something everybody in the room has dealt with at one time or another, but I'm starting to get the sense is you realize pretty quickly, I can't 
possibly grant every idea I like because I don't have the money to grant every idea. Like my saying no does not mean I don't think there's some value in what you're doing, but I have to make choices. And so, you know, and so I think everybody just thinks like, well, I really like this idea. And then you hear it bounce back to you as like, well, he's really interested in what we're doing. He, I think he's going to fund. It's like, well, don't go so far on that. Just I like the idea. It's competing with a lot of other ideas I like, and and there's going to have to be some real hard decisions about which ones provide the most potential value for sort of journalism at large. Um, so I'm realizing quickly that part of what you have to say when you're talking to people and you tell them you think it's an interesting idea, you have to caveat it a little bit to say, and I it's one of the many interesting ideas I'm hearing right now, and I have to make some hard choices somewhere down the road, but we're happy to consider, you know, because I feel like it's easy to give people the hope that you more hope than you intended to just by a slight comment so that's the adjustment you make when you come from when you're you know one side of the table to the other is realizing like don't over promise uh you know just being very clear about your interest but also make it clear that there's a lot of things you're juggling and uh but that was the last lesson I, i've just learned that one in the last couple of days i think which just hit me that i have to be a little bit more uh, clear that this is a good idea as are many others competing for the same uh, you know, amount of cash. Well, thank you, Jim. And thanks for our time together. Really appreciate it. It's a wonderful discussion yeah. and, and welcome to the world of philanthropy. I know we're thank you. Forward to working. we look forward to working with you. Yeah, and, uh, no, it's, gonna, it's been so much fun so far. Look forward to meeting uh, those of you in the room. Wonderful. So now we'll go live for our Q&A. So hang on just a sec. Hello again, Jim. Hello. How are you? You've changed. You've changed scenery. I think from one beach to another. Are you in Miami? In Miami, yes, and I've been beautiful hotel room with the classic hotel room art. <laughs> very, very lovely. I'm in my office in uh, in in Philadelphia. You'll be moving to Miami, you and Joan. Yes. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, it was a wonderful conversation. I hope everyone enjoyed it. We got some terrific questions in the chat and I'm, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to get to all of them. And so I'm gonna to try to bundle some, some together. There are a lot of questions about your priorities and whether or not Knight's priorities for funding are shifting and how you feel about funding innovation in, in newsrooms and news organizations. And I think you touched on a lot of that. I mean, you spoke about the need for collaboration between organizations you know, interest in innovation and it all sort of tears up to the business model and business sustainability um, for news. But it was really interesting to me the way you really doubled down on the idea that at the end of the day, it has to be replicable. There has to be learnings from it that can be shared with other news organizations, which requires, you know, a sort of a generosity of organizations to work together that way, to share their best practices, a level of transparency. So I think those things will all be important when people want to talk to you and the foundation about work about work they're undertaking. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. do, do you have any thoughts about, uh, this is from Lisa Gardner Springer, how much you're considering shifting to general operating support or, or special project support? Are you going to be very targeted in the specific things you want to fund or sort of more ongoing support for organizations that you know are doing, doing good work? I mean, I think, I think I mean, we certainly have done some, some general ops things. I don't think that's the majority of what we've done, and I doubt it will be the majority going forward. I think what we're, you know, again, general ops, if it helps one organization be successful, that's wonderful. But if there's no lessons to be derived from that for the broader uh, media world, uh, notice I did not use ecosystem. So I'm just sure <laughs> this that'll be my last reference to that word, I hope. But uh, but yeah, so I think that's still the goal is to, to try to put funding behind things that others can can take and learn from and grow off of. And again, whether it's a service or a tool or, uh, or knowledge. So, so yeah, I think it, you know, it's going to be a case by case basis. I don't I don't think you're going to see a, I don't think you'll see a wave of general gen ops um, investments, because I think, you know, unless that there is a larger story to be told beyond that um, for the, that that site can tell using that those funds. Do you see a, a balance? I mean, how do you, this is actually, I'll use Karen Hawkins from Chicago's Reader exact words. What do you see as the pros and cons of funding a wide variety of outlets versus picking a few quote unquote winners to back or, or projects to back? Well, I think the model that we're aiming for would basically put the tools in the hands of as many sites as possible. And then I think the winners, the kind of the winners and the, and the losers in that scenario will be 
not chosen by us, they'll really fall onto the same things that most winners and losers end up being chosen by, which is execution, timing, luck. Um, so I don't think we're trying to necessarily pick winners because I don't know. You know I think we, we have always, I guess you always pick winners in the sense that you grant money to some places versus others. But I don't think like we're trying to, and when I hear pick winners, it's like, who's going to win in this one sector? I don't think we're trying to do that. I think we're trying to provide the tools and the opportunities for as many sites to flourish as possible. And then kind of then the classic market, it's a market effect will take, will kick in and, and some will do well and others won't. But I don't think we're trying to pick uh, winners. Uh, I, don't, I don't, you know, that's, that's a pretty high risk, a pretty high risk way to go. If you pick, you know, you pick five winners and four of them are wrong, it's a pretty disastrous outcome. I think the idea here is to weaponize as many um, entrepreneurs and legacy media organizations as possible and let the best execution and uh, operations win. Uh, it's not for us to decide who they are. It's to set, let, allow the conditions for that, many of them to move forward. So, so much of this is, you know, out of all of the organizations and projects that you fund, you know, the sharing of best practices and the learnings from it. I know you started at night at the same time as a new head of um, communications for the yep. foundation. Are you two starting to work together on how to resource and share information and how you're thinking yes. differently about your partnerships with with organizations yeah absolutely and, and even in just even in just how we as a as, a, as the journalism department karen john and i how we communicate out what we're up to and also to give updates on things that we have uh, we have funded in the past that have hit nice big landmarks and i think we do want to do i would like to get more out there about what we're um not just what we're um, providing grants to because that you can find that pretty easily, but why and and how those things fit into the overall strategy and, and whether that's in the form of occasional, um, you know, yeah, occasional blog posts or some form of a, of a newsletter. Um, I think that's that's we certainly want to put more information out there about that. So and I think there's, you know, that's a goal of mine. And I, Heidi and I have talked a lot about uh, a lot about doing something in that regard. So, yes, you, you'll see some stuff in that uh, area for sure. Becky Boname, and I'm sorry, Becky, if I mispronounced your last name, uh, wrote in the chat the challenges that rural newspapers have and lagging tremendously in the transition to digital. You know, in Western Iowa, many don't even have a website and have old technology and they need considerable resources to make that digital transformation occur. Are you looking uh, with any special initiatives or special eye towards rural news organizations? At one of the sessions we had yesterday, somebody talked about sort of the flyover states, not as they're called, uh, not necessarily getting as much attention, not from night necessarily, but just generally um, yeah. than other sort of urban coastal, you know, areas. Yeah, I think, and I think that's a fair point. Uh, as, as from our conversation, I mean, I've, I've been all over the country and and, and actually on those trips would always try to pick a newspaper up uh, in towns we would go through just out of this pile at home of papers from all over the country from that trip. And, you know, it was fascinating to see the differences in them if you went from one town in Oklahoma to the next town in Oklahoma, our city. So um, I don't know that I don't, I, I can't say like there's a rural news initiative specifically. I think the idea still stands that, oh, let me, let me say one more thing too. I do think if 2021 is the moment in which you decide you're going to make the, it's time to make the digital shift. I'm not sure that greatest candidate for us to be honest because that's i'm not sure in 2021 it might be too late to make that shift if you really don't have websites or you haven't put any effort into digital it's hard to build digital audience and it's hard to build digital business and the more runway you've given yourself the more likely you are to succeed so i i, I do think in general like continuing to support legacy organizations is something we'll surely do but it will also be for the most part i think legacy organizations that have made some you know progress toward that transition already that said, in cases like that, we would, I think, night, you know, I, I think we would be happy to have conversations with organizations like that to see if there's a way for us to, you know, to try to unleash some capital elsewhere, whether we can play a role in, in you know, uh, finding funding for uh, those particular publications. Whether we would do a larger rural news initiative is something certainly would, would consider, because um, I have a, like, as per our conversation, a, I very much tried not to be the East Coast guy, even though it's where I've lived my whole life, not be that person um, in, a, in action. So I would certainly open, be open to a conversation about that. I just wanted to throw the one caveat about starting the transition in 2021. I'm not sure those are the places that would be priorities for us just because it might be too late. If I'm, I mean, being too blunt, I'm sorry, but I don't know how we start that transformation. If you're if you, if you have five, six years to really make that transformation, then maybe you can make it. But if the 
if the if the doors are threatening to close in a, in a year and that's when organizations are starting to make that digital shift I, I i don't think that's nearly enough time to do it efficiently no matter who funds you and how much they give you yeah it's a, it's a real challenge we see it in our you know in our own work even in philadelphia that sort of it takes time to build that audience um, um for sure i think we said in our interview you know it's not if you build it they will come it really it, it really does take time to, to make yeah. the transition um, shifting our focus a little bit, a question from Paul Chung, how will you ensure that diversity, equity, and inclusion is front and center in your decision-making process, given that the demographic shift is increasingly more diverse and yet journalism is, is often, you know, white-led? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think the way DEI fits into our strategies, I, the way I always describe it is it's, it's, um, it's, it's uh, always horizontal and sometimes vertical. It's got to run through everything we fund. It's got to be a consideration in any individual thing we fund. And it's also going to be something we directly address in, in certain grants. And I think you'll, without, without giving too much away, I think you'll see that in uh, shortly in, uh, in some grants that are coming over the next couple of months. Um, but I think it's, it's clearly it has to be a focus. And, and I do think it has to be a focus in pretty much everything that you fund um and i but, but as i said i think you also have to fund very specific initiatives there too so i think you'll i think you'll see uh, uh you'll see soon uh, kind of how we're gonna uh, address uh, dei you know at least some portion of, of the of the uh, dei uh, uh issue um mickey asked a question about um uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing my notes a little bit, telling digital stories with multiple perspectives. And if you're starting to get into grant making and looking at the work that Knight has done in the past, um, do you have examples, she asks, of how low budget sort of multiple perspective storytelling that you ended up funding or that you've seen that she and others can can learn from sort of in this spirit of, uh, of replication and learning? Um, I'm not sure, like multi, I'm not sure I know what multi, what was the phrase in there, multi, Multi -pers multiple perspective storytelling. I don't know if that means multimedia or different types of media or different voices. I don't know uh, what that exactly that refers to, but um, certainly there are there are organizations that we have funded that have been doing storytelling in, in different ways. I think or, or smaller sites that have been uh, we funded Sahan Journal last year in St. Paul that's covering immigrant immigrant communities immigrant communities around the Twin Cities, um, and that was you know and that also is you know for those who don't know. Uh, St. Paul is a night city. There are uh, eight night cities, Philadelphia being another one, um, that we, we, we often do funding for uh, media inside those communities because they're, they're, uh, they're formerly night or they're night cities because they used to have publications in those cities. So yes, we did, we've done like Tahan Journal. There's, um, I'm trying to think we did, uh, God, we did Centro de Paradisimo Investiga Investiga Investigativo and in, uh, can't speak to them talking all day in Puerto Rico. I can't remember when we did that, but um, so we do certainly we do certainly do funding and uh, and then smaller storytelling. Uh, it's not I wouldn't say it's a anywhere near a majority of where our funding goes, but but again, if you're telling stories in a way that or you've developed a storytelling technology that is replicable across, then that that would put it in a that put it in a, in a different category in terms of how we would. Do it. So it's, it sounds like you're starting to get involved in the grant making process already if you have some grants that are coming out in the next couple of months, which is really exciting sort of jumping in head first and certainly building, you know, with big shoes to fill building on the shoulders of the folks before you uh, with Paul and Jennifer and yeah. of course Karen is still working with you, which is terrific. Um, how far in advance do you, do you plan how far when you if you see something now and you think we're not going to fund it now. We may fund it later. Or are you thinking about? Are you starting to think about three years from now what you'd like to see and what you'd like to be engaged and involved in? Or is it a little bit more immediate than that? Right now, my biggest focus is Monday. Um, <laughs> so no, I mean it's you no, know, it's a new, it's a new. I think that'll change over time. I think in terms of literally how we plan is you know we do we have four quarterly board meetings in which we do you know grants of above two hundred fifty thousand dollars go to the board. So those the the the, the the time frame on those is always going to be fairly long. Um, we can do other grants below that much more quickly, um, but it's you know it's certainly not a we're not a breaking news organization in the sense we're going to turn something around in two days. Um, 
but no, I think, I think the idea is, and you know, for the way that my starting date played out as I arrived uh, right about the time the 2022 budget was being done, right about the time the December board meeting planning was starting. So I kind of came in right at a time in which there was an awful lot going on. And I'm really, uh, really committed to taking December pretty much off. And I don't mean off from work, but off from meetings to really to, to have a better answer to the question you asked by January 1st. I think, you know, I, I want to, you know, I want to move as efficiently as possible, but I, I, I don't want to be the person who sits here and says right now I have that stuff all figured out yet. Um, but it's, uh, you know, I think we'll be looking and I think how far out you're looking is going to depend on what you're looking at. Right. I still think like technology is a good example. Should we be looking at technologies that are four or five years off? Absolutely. But we can't do that at the expense of focusing on like the, the technologies of the moment, like, you know, CRM, CMS, you know, uh, even AI, which may be not, not the biggest thing yet, but it's not too far off and it's not five years off probably. So you, you kind of have to keep an eye out on different timeframes, but based on when you think something is really going to hit, um, knowing you may even get that wrong. Um, but so I think our time frame is going to be different depending on what category uh, it is that we're looking to fund. I think, you know, there's sustainability. There's always going to be an urgency. If there's a model out there, there's something out there that we think is going to make a significant difference in the overall sustainability of, of local news organizations. That's going to, that's going to move us some alacrity. That leaves a little bit to a question from Frank Munging. If you have sort of set any relative priorities for supporting different areas, I know you talked about technology uh, innovation, but, you know, so the priorities of technology transformation, leadership development versus journalists and journalism. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly um, technology is, you know, Paul did a, did a great job in the years he was at, at night focused on technology and looking around the bend at all the things that were coming. And certainly um, you know, we're going to uh, fill a job with someone who can do, uh, who can fill that role. I do think technology is really important. Again, today's technology and next, next decade's technology, both. Uh, I think we're certainly going to have a focus on sustainability in one of the other positions. We have two open positions at the moment um, that uh, we're in, we're in the process of interviewing for right now, and then sustainability is um, is going to be a focus of the other one. I mean, leadership to me has got to be a focus because I think it's been, you know, I would say maybe this is uh, be unpopular with uh, some on the call, but I think leadership has been a real challenge in in journalism for the last 15, 20 years. I think it's. Uh, you know, I, I won't bore you with the reasons why I think that is, but I do think the leadership development is really crucial because um, in the end, a lot of startup rise or fail based on the quality of leadership. And like mm -hmm. I said, the idea can get you so far, but eventually you have to be able to manage that uh, P&L and you have to be able to manage that staff and you have to be able to manage that tech stack and you have to really, and you've got to make terrible hard decisions that sometimes uh, are ones you hate to do, but you have to do them to keep the business running. And so I do think that kind of leadership and that discipline is something that I, I would love to encourage and, 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 and uh, put some funding behind ways to, to deepen the well of, uh, of really great leaders in this industry, because there's, there's, plenty, there's plenty of them out there, but I'd like to uh, focus on trying to create more, because um, I think it's, it's crucial. Well, thanks, Jim. I, I'm mindful of the time. We've hit our 12 o'clock mark. I know there's so much more we could keep talking about, and I'm I'm sure you'll be hearing from many people on the call moving forward. And we look forward to getting to know you more and the work you're going to do with your colleagues at night and uh, working together to build a better media, I won't say ecosystem, but thank yeah, you very much. And I would just say as, as a closing thing, thank you so much, Annie. Um, the, uh, people who ask questions, if you want to ask them, uh, send me an email. I will, I'll be glad to answer them via email if, I, if we get to them here or you're unsatisfied with the answer. Um, I'm just Brady at kf.org. Thank you, Jim. Really appreciate that. And thanks sure, to all of you for joining us for this call. We hope you'll come back at 1230 for some more sessions, including building a fundraising program from scratch with Johanna Derlega at the 19th and the Lenfest Institute's Rebecca Foreman. We have a session on ethical storytelling and human-centered social impact led by Shahandra harris McRae at the Inclusion Firm, a session on community foundations and newsrooms partnering to create sustainable local news with Steve Waldman of Report for America, David Mengabir of Grand Traverse City Regional Community Foundation and Paula <clears throat> Brown Hines of Voice Media Ventures, and a community chat on fundraising for small news organizations with Wuika and Ibo at the Invisible Institute. We have lots more sessions at 2.30 as well, and we'll close our day at 3.30 with a discussion about the documentary Storm Lake and with Yossi Lichterman in conversation with Art Cullen, 
Beth Levison and Kyle Munson, and I uh, hope you'll join us for the full day of programming on this final day of the summit. If you're enjoying yourself and learning a lot, please tweet about it at hashtag Newsville Summit. And please don't forget to complete the short fundraising survey that we sent you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again, Jim, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.